Uh, it is truly an honor to speak at the flagship institution in my home state. 21st century concepts of liberty and freedom, citizenship and civil rights are inextricably linked to the struggle for union during the American Civil War. The conflict, which spanned four years, fundamentally redefined what it meant to be an American. And in doing so, moved the country closer to those self-evident truths that are embedded in the Declaration of Independence. Prior to 1861, more than four million African Americans were held in bondage and enjoyed few rights that white men were bound to respect. By the end of the war, the institution of slavery was dead. Black men had served militarily, and African Americans were on the path to becoming the citizens of the United States of America. The emancipation of the nation's enslaved population and the social ascension of African Americans, especially black men that followed, represented the greatest social shift in the history of the world. And as such, the African American experience is at the heart of the story of the Civil War. Now this evening, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about my research. My research focuses on black military service, free labor, and education right here in this state during the Civil War. My dissertation, which I, I recently defended, began as a project that I completed for a summer internship that I had with the Mr. Missouri State Archives. And at that time, I was tasked with creating a narrative of black military participation during the war. And towards this end, I was given access to any and every document that the archives had in its possession. And while I was able to create a, a very detailed regimental history of the six official black regiments from the state, I started to realize that there was a yet untold story about the African American experience and the African American response to the Civil War. And it was sitting right in front of me. Now the first red flag that stood out to me were the numbers. Were the numbers, there we go. According to official records, a total of 8,344 African American men served in federal regiments during the war. Now that number sounds significant, but when we compare that to the number of African Americans living in Missouri in 1860, about 115,000, that number only represents about 10% of the population that, that served militarily during the war. It's only 39%, that 8,344 number only represents 39% of the total black male population of fighting age. Now, at the outset of the war, when they started enlisting African American men, military officials here in Missouri in early December of 1863 estimated that at least 20,000 enslaved men in this state could be enlisted and recruited into the Union Army, more than double than actually served. So what happened to the other 61%? Well, what this meant was that the vast majority of black men in Missouri, in essence, rejected military service during the Civil War. Usually they did this in favor of other options, most notably waged labor. Now, this was something that I, I really had not anticipated. In Civil War scholarship, black men's enlistment and active participation in the war effort has been prioritized and connected directly to abolitionism. Black soldiers struggling to assert their humanity and their patriotism have been generally venerated as sable warriors of what Abraham Lincoln called a new birth of freedom. They were supposedly men who enlisted to destroy slavery, emancipate the race, and save the Union. This is what early and modern narratives of black participation in the war outlined. This was the story that they told. Now, early books on black participation in the Civil War were written really as laudatory treatises that extolled the virtue and heroism of black soldiers. 
all directly and indirectly connected black military service with a selfless desire to destroy slavery in America. Later books have followed the same course. But yet, as we will discuss this evening, the singular focus on black men being the central figures in a conquering abolitionist narrative fails to fully unpack the various reasons why black men elected to fight for a nation that had previously sanctioned their enslavement. Black men's decision to, oops, I just dropped my water. That was not good. Hopefully I won't slip. Black men's decision to serve militarily in Missouri and elsewhere was not simply rooted in a desire to destroy slavery as a whole, but it was in fact more nuanced. While notions of self-sacrifice and collective emancipation, this notion emancipation of the entire race, encouraged some black men to join federal regiments, the vast majority of black Missourians, like their white counterparts, based their decisions on their immediate needs and the needs of their family. The need for food, shelter, and clothing. Black men whose families suffered intensely because of wartime depravity and a lack of resources did not have the luxury to be guided by aspiration or ideology. Instead, their decisions were directly linked to the conditions of themselves and their families. The fact that some black men decided to work or not to enlist does not negate their genuine desire to see slavery abolished in America. Their decisions and their actions, however, reflected a measure of their newly found autonomy as well as the very real conditions that black families faced during the war. The slow and painful and disorderly death of slavery in Missouri led to unprecedented suffering among the state's African-American population. And thus, when the Union Army opened the, the uh, ranks to black men, most recruits had either been recently enslaved or were in poor financial shape with limited job opportunities. In other words, these men were extremely desperate. The lofty goals of destroying slavery in America and securing black citizenship were an afterthought for men whose families were starving and dying quite literally in front of their eyes. Now, I really think it's appropriate to provide a little bit more context to the African American experience in the Civil War, briefly outlining these ideas or evolving ideas regarding slavery, the aims of the war, and the unique conditions that black Missourians found themselves in is truly helpful in understanding why black men responded in the manner that they did. When the Civil War began in April of 1861, enslaved Missourians here in Missouri and their counterparts elsewhere watched the conflict closely, hoping that the war would bring about slavery's demise. Initially, there was very little evidence that this would occur. Some Union politicians and military officials fervently denied that this was a war to end slavery. In July of 1861, Congress articulated this notion by passing something known as the Crittenden-Johnson Resolution. Named for co-sponsors, Representative John Crittenden of Kentucky and future Vice President and President Andrew Johnson of Tennessee, the resolution stated that this war is not waged upon our park in any spirit of oppression, nor for any purpose of conquest or subjugation, nor purpose of overthrowing or interfering with the rights or established institution of those states, slavery, but to defend and maintain the supremacy of the Constitution and to preserve the Union with all the dignity, equality, and rights of the several states unimpaired, and that as soon as these objects are accomplished, the war ought to cease. Now, although this position mirrored that of the Lincoln administration, other Union politicians in Congress and some military officials had 
really no reservations about interfering with slavery. As long as it advanced the aim of the Union and helped to bring the South back into the national fold. In the summer of 1861, small fissures in the institution of slavery began to manifest. One of the first developments occurred in Virginia, a little over a month after the war started. Soon after he assumed uh, command of Fort Monroe in Virginia, this guy here, uh, in May of 1861, Major General Je Benjamin Butler, began to label runaway slaves who were seeking uh, security or shelter behind Union line as contrabands of war. Now, the term contraband in a time of war referred to property that gave some benefit to the opposing side. And according to the, the rules of war, it was something that could be legally seized. Now, Butler reasoned that enslaved people who were considered property provided a material benefit to their owners by virtue of their labor and their presence. Enslaved people could cook meals. They could sew clothes. They could build fortifications and attend to army officers. And since Virginia was one of those states that had seceded that, or had left the Union and joined the Confederacy, Butler believed his actions to be both justified and legal. Now, Butler's contraband designation began to alter the direction and the meaning of the war and emboldened enslaved men and women to seek shelter behind Union lines. But let me be very clear about Butler's actions. At this point in the war, Butler's contraband designation represented a change in strategy rather than an attempt to extinguish slavery in America. Confiscation at this time served a very practical purpose, as it not only allowed Union forces to seize or appropriate black men for work, but it also deprived the Confederacy of its primary labor force. But nonetheless, Butler's novel interpretation of the Constitution and wartime powers led Union officials to eventually adopt and formalize this policy throughout the Army. This directly resulted in the passage of a law known as the First Confiscation Act. This happens in August of 1861. But the First Confiscation Act, as many of us might know, does not abolish slavery. And the First Confiscation Act says nothing about freeing those slaves who had been confiscated. But it does, however, provide a, a small opening for some enslaved people to secure Union protection from their masters. In Missouri, in the first months of the war, a closely related but unique set of circumstances began to undermine the institution of slavery here in the home state of myself. In mid-July, of 1861, Brigadier General John Pope, commanding officer of the District of Northeastern Missouri, issued threats to local citizens who stood idly by as guerrillas wreaked havoc in the area. When local citizens failed to act, Pope, and Pope threatened to begin seizing property, including property and slaves. Now, he had hoped that his policy would have the dual effect of, of breaking up these roving bands uh, of marauders, as he called them, and turning the community against them, who he believed sheltered them at this time. Pope's threat, or his general orders number three, as he called it, was effective, and it temporarily stopped the guerrilla violence was, that was plaguing northeastern Missouri. But although northeastern Missouri was, for the time being, somewhat free of guerrilla warfare, the rest of the state was becoming quickly a tinderbox. As a result of the monarch support for the Confederacy, central and southern Missouri began a quick descent into chaos and open war. With a significant victory at the Battle of Wilson's Creek uh, on August 10th of 1861, and threats to Rolla, Ironton, Potosi, 
and other areas, Union officials became desperate because of the Confederacy's uh, growing presence in Missouri. Now, aware of the effectiveness of Pope's policy in the northeastern part of the state, Major General John C. Fremont, head of Union operations in Missouri, implemented his own extreme measures to slow the Confederate advance in Missouri. On August 30th of 1861, Fremont proclaimed martial law in Missouri and declared that anyone taking up arms against the Union would be executed. Further, and, and more importantly for this discussion, Fremont's declaration also intended, uh, included a clause that emancipated the slaves of actively disloyal Missourians. Fremont's Emancipation Proclamation, as it has been referred to, was issued in the same vein as Pope's orders the previous month. And it really served as a, a very heavy-handed approach to restore order in a state that was quickly spiraling out of control. Fremont's proclamations, as you could imagine, sent shockwaves throughout the state. And it really was not just because of the draconian punishment outlined for Confederate supporters, but because of this threat to the institution of slavery. As you can also imagine, Fremont's Emancipation Proclamation was extremely controversial, and it does not remain in force for very long. And while we often characterize Abraham Lincoln as the great emancipator, at this time, Politically, he was not there yet. Lincoln did not want to unnerve loyal slave owners, particularly in Missouri or Kentucky, who were told very explicitly that this was not a war to destroy, destroy slavery. Plus, he did not believe that Lincoln's, I'm sorry, uh, Fremont's actions to be in line with the First Confiscation Act. Lincoln is going to secretly request that Fremont rescind this Emancipation Proclamation. Fremont, who was a political rival of Lincoln, uh, started to try to grandstand. He sent a reply back to Lincoln stating, if you really want me to do this, make your rebuke of me public. Well, Lincoln said that's not a problem. And he sent a reply. And instead of listening to the President of the United States of America, Fremont made 200 more copies of his Emancipation Proclamation and sent them around the state. And as you could probably guess, Fremont lost his job. Fremont's experiment of sorts was a failure. Only two uh, men were emancipated, and there was the question of whether that was done legally. But slowly but surely, surely, other Unionists started to begin to view the targeted destruction of slavery as essential to the broader Union cause. So as the war intensified the following year, the institution of slavery became an even greater tar target than it had been previously. In the summer of 1862, Congress com uh, clarified through what was known as the Second Confiscation Act that human property, i.e. slaves, could not only be confiscated, but freed as well. This, the passage of this law was significant in disrupting slavery in Missouri. And enslaved people before the Emancipation Proclamation who made it to Union lines and affirm their master's disloyalty could receive their freedom. And here, actually, uh, is an example of testimony given by a former slave in August of 1862 to his master's disloyalty. I'll read it to you because it's a little hard to read. He says, I belong to Anderson Bowles, who resides in Manchester, Missouri, and his two sons are in the Southern Army, and is well known to be a secessionist. Mr. Bowles beat me very often, and I left home on the 27th day of July last. People like uh, this unnamed enslaved man 
did this over and over again. And just several years before, testimony from a black man against a white man would not be received in court. But in 1862, it was enough to secure a person's freedom. Here are, here is a very rare example of papers issued to someone freed not by the Emancipation Proclamation, but by the Confiscation Act, the Second Confiscation Act. Uh, the person emancipated was a woman by the name of uh, Eliza Turner. Uh, there is a, another one uh, for her son as well. But she was the slave of the man we see on the right, Truston Polk. Some of you might be familiar with that name. Truston Polk was a former governor of Missouri. And at the time that the war began, he was a senator. Polk is going to be expelled from the Senate for supporting the Confederacy, and he will eventually become a colonel in the Confederate Army. But it's going to be the Confiscation Acts, and I think that we don't give enough credit to them, that will first formally allow enslaved people to secure a new life legally away from slavery. But in the discussion of the death of slavery in America, historians and lay people often place significant emphasis on the Emancipation Proclamation. First issued following the Union's victory at Antietam in September of 1862, the Emancipation Proclamation did not affect Missouri in the way that many might think. President Lincoln's signature decree proclaimed free the vast majority of the nation's enslaved population. But although enslaved people had to either escape to Union lines or wait till the Union army occupied the area in which they lived to secure their freedom, the Emancipation Proclamation nonetheless destabilized the institution of slavery and significantly weakened the Confederate economy. But Lincoln's measure was starkly different than any other executive order he had previously, previously released. It was absent of any tone of concession or reconciliation, and he forcefully articulated that the war would be won by any means necessary. The proclamation was intended to disrupt not only the southern economy, but the slave society as a whole. It sowed discord on plantations and turned faithful slaves into potential spies. It transformed enslaved cooks and attendants working in Confederate camps into Union moles. It emboldened passive servants to become fugitive slaves and, began, and gave men who had been stripped of their manhood an opportunity to choose a new path for themselves and their families. With the Emancipation Proclamation, Lincoln ensured that slavery, slavery itself would be the greatest Confederate casualty of the war. But while the Emancipation Proclamation nominally freed millions of people, several hundred thousand remained legally in bondage as the Emancipation Proclamation did not directly apply to loyal slave states, also known as border states. And as a result, the loyal, states, loyal slave states of Missouri, Kentucky, Maryland, and Delaware were exempted from this part of the Emancipation Proclamation. Slavery is not declared illegal in this state until January 11th of 1865. While the Emancipation Proclamation did not grant freedom to enslaved people in this state, it did undermine slavery in Missouri. If you ever get a chance to read the entire Emancipation Proclamation, there are several clauses. Towards the end of the proclamation, after declaring who would be free and who would not, Lincoln proclaimed this. He said this, that such persons of suitable condition will be received into the armed services, to garrison forts, positions, stations, and other places, and to man vessels of all sorts in said service. In layman's terms, he said that the Union Army would soon be receiving black men into the service. Lincoln's Emancipation Proclamation, and especially this clause, 
unleashed a nightmare scenario in the South. Not only were enslaved men and women emboldened to try to escape to Union lines, but now some were tempted to pick up a gun and enlist. Former Missouri slave William Wells Brown really hit home when he talked about the psychological implications of giving arms to ex-slaves. He said he noted that slaveholders, quote, trembled at the idea of meeting men in open combat whose backs they had lacerated, whose wives and daughters they had turn, turn, torn from their bosoms, whose hearts were bleeding from the wounds inflicted by them. But before black men could enlist in the Union Army, and before the Emancipation Proclamation went to, into effect, change began to appear right here in Missouri. Now, encouraged by developments locally and nationally, African American men and women moved their own individual agendas forward with greater resolve. This came by way of uh, continued disruptions on plantations, escapes to free states, and most notably by armed action. And while sometimes we, we assume that slaves were passive and they were waiting to be rescued, the reality is, is that many people, unconcerned with whether the Emancipation Proclamation applied to them or not, unconcerned about what, what day that went into effect, they pushed and resisted against their slavery in many ways that we have not given fully credit to. One of the earliest examples of really some very stark pushback against the institution of slavery happened on Christmas Day, 1862, when a citizen informed military officials that a band of armed black men in Gasconade County had crossed the river into Montgomery County to forcibly liberate slaves on their own. Now, the citizen complained, according to his, his letters, that this was not the first time that they had done this. They had done this twice before in the weeks preceding. And he, according to him, the militia knew about them, and they had failed to address the threat. The citizen fearfully noted that all the Negroes at Herman either had a gun, a pistol, or a large knife. Scary stuff. Revolution was percolating in Missouri, and black guerrillas remained a concern in early 1863 as well. A slaveholder in, in southeastern Missouri expressed his fear that armed blacks, along with some Union soldiers, would systematically destroy the institution of slavery, not only in that part of the state, but throughout the country. In a letter to his son, uh, Missouri slave old slaveholder Greer Davis wrote, the ghost of John Brown is marching along still. Davis wrote of several incidents of roving bands of black guerrillas descending upon plantations in Cape Girardeau and forcibly liberating enslaved people many people who were family members of those who had escaped earlier. Davis wrote of this fear of he, that he and other slave owners had of this threat. They said this, a large number are congregated at Cape Girardeau. If they want any of their family, they can arm themselves, go with soldiers, and take them. And they can with the same forcibly take any other property we have, as we have no weapons as long as the government permits Negroes to remain at the Cape and the citizens of that place take no steps to have them removed, no one in the country is safe in person or property. And we are alike unarmed. Despite the disruptions to the institution in early of 1863, slavery was very much alive and very legal in Missouri. But chattel slavery in America was approaching a tipping point. Unitarian minister and founder of Washington University really summed up the tension in the air at the time. And he said, such was the condition of things in the spring of 1863. 
unsettled, revolutionary, with nothing clearly defined, neither slave nor slaveholder having any rights which they felt to mutually respect. But in light of the Emancipation Proclamation, Missouri struggled to maintain a balance between protecting slavery, which remained legal in the state, and supporting the Union. Now, the effects of the Emancipation Proclamation are first really truly felt in August of 1863. And in that month, Union officials began recruitment for the first black military regiment in the state. But concerns about unnerving loyal slave owners pushed the governor and other officials to only enlist free men and slaves of disloyal owners. Further and more surprisingly when I, when I think about this, the regiment did not even receive a Missouri state designation. They were given the name the 3rd Arkansas Infantry African Descent. We're a little ways away from Arkansas. They'll, they will eventually be called the 56th uh, United States Colored Infantry. But as soon as they were mustered in at St. Louis, they were removed from the state. Though associated with Arkansas in name only, these soldiers of the 3rd Arkansas and the 56th USCI would continue in, in official documents to refer to themselves as black men or black soldiers from the state of the Missouri. There's actually a monument dedicated to them in Jefferson Barracks, uh, in a little bit farther south of uh, St. Louis. This monument um, was put up, I believe, at the beginning of the 20th, 20th century. And it was dedicated to the 175 soldiers from this unit who died uh, from a cholera outbreak as they were mustering out, uh, or they were on their way to muster out uh, in August of 1866. If you ever get a chance to go down to Jefferson Barracks in St. Louis, it is a very interesting monument to behold. But this policy of enlisting free people and the slaves of disloyal owners only, only remained in place for about two months. Following fall elections, uh, the War Department amended the parameters of recruitment in Missouri, widening their scope to include all able-bodied men, regardless of condition of loyalty, condition or loyalty of their masters. And consequently, five additional African-American regiments were created. Uh, they were initially called the 1st, 2nd, 3rd, and 4th Missouri Regiment Colored Infantries, but they would eventually, in March of 1864, be given federal designations, and they would be called the 62nd, the 65th, the 67th, and the 68th United States Colored Infantries, respectively. Uh, the Army is going to add a, uh, a new federal regiment in 1864 known as the 18th uh, United States Colored Infantry, and it too would be based out of Missouri. But why would black men, especially those who were ineligible for emancipation under the Confiscation Acts or the Emancipation Proclamation, fight for the Union when the Union had maintained that slavery would main, remain legal in border states? When they said that this was not a war to destroy slavery? Was it because black men wanted to affirm their patriotism? Was it to assert their manhood? Was it to show themselves equal to any man? My research suggests otherwise. Now, Abraham Lincoln was well aware that patriotism and perhaps a chance to strike a blow against slavery nationally was not enough to entice black men into the army locally. In August of 1863, writing to a friend of his who opposed the Emancipation Proclamation and opposed uh, the use of African-American soldiers in battle, he wrote this response to him, and it really kind of brings home why black men joined the army. Abraham Lincoln said this. He said, but Negroes, like others, act upon motives. Why should they do anything for us if we will do nothing for them? 
if they stake their lives for us, they must be prompted by the strongest motive, even the promise of freedom. And the promise being made must be kept. But while some black men, and I, I stress some, selflessly enlisted for the purpose of helping to destroy slavery nationwide and to prove their worthiness, most joined the Union Army to achieve more basic goals. As I alluded to earlier, slavery dies in, in piecemeal fashion in Missouri. It is a messy process, and a number of enslaved people are going to suffer. But the reason why most black men in Missouri, and, and perhaps nationwide, joined the Union Army is because that the Army provided them that which they could not initially secure on their own, their freedom and a steady income. Enlistment ensured immediate emancipation to any enslaved man accepted into the service, regardless of his master's loyalty. Black soldiers also received $10 a month until the summer of 1864, when their pay was made equal to that of white soldiers at $13 a month. In addition, they also received shelter, regular meals, and new clothing. This new life as freedmen and as soldiers saved many formerly enslaved people from utter destitution. It also helped them to take care of their families, many members who remained in slavery. But because enlistment was the only way that some men could secure their freedom, many risked death to enlist into the Union Army. And reflective of their desperation, recruits who fled to Union lines were often subject to intimidation. Some were beaten and some were killed. A very small number would die in combat, but many more, like George Ellis of the 65th USCT, would die of disease. But despite the dangers associated with escape and enlistment, more than 8,000 African American men from this state believe the military uh, military service, excuse me, preferential to further enslavement in Missouri. And as the peculiar institution collapsed around the state, the military re remained the best available option for a number of black men fleeing slavery in late 1863 and late 1864. Many men would serve heroically and participate in a small number of notable battles and in fact, black soldiers from this state who served in the United States uh, 62nd USCT would, according to official sources, fire the last shots of the Civil War on May 13th of 1865 at the Battle of Palmetto Ranch. Now, while what black Missouri men did while in the Army is a very interesting story. It is not the focus of my talk tonight. I really want to bring it back to why they served and not simply what they did as soldiers. Enlistment freed a number of men, gave them a better life, but there were segments of the African American population that opposed military service for various reasons. Some didn't want to be separated from their families. Uh, and when black men went into the, the service and had me members of their family remaining in slavery, many slave owners took out their frustration and their anger on those families that remained on the plantation. Other men believed the rumors that they would be treated worse in the army than they had been in slavery. Others simply did not want anyone else to control their labor their bodies, or their lives. One of the first instances, and I, I found this fascinating when I, when I discovered this, one of the first instances that we have when we see African American men publicly opposing enlistment occurs very shortly after the Union Army opened to all black men regardless of condition. At the city of Union in Franklin County in December of 1863, about 50 black men who were 
forced to enlist in the army by the slave masters during the holiday, returned home and they rebelled. Now, they had been forced into the army, but they had received a furlough to come home to spend time with their families during the holiday, which was really a, a very special time for enslaved families. After enjoying the company of their families, the soldiers, drunk on holiday liquor, turned their attention to their former masters. These men, according to letters from the former masters in Union, Missouri, these soldiers threatened to destroy the town and everyone who was in it. One young man, 17-year-old Spencer Childs, who we see his name at the, the top, returned to Union on the very day that he was forced into the service and burned down his former master's home. All of these events occurred because these men did not want to go into the military. This is not a suggestion. This is not me reading in between the lines. This is exactly what the primary sources state. But although the reaction of the former slaves in Franklin County was, was somewhat extreme, this was not an uncommon sentiment, as former slaves actually considered, some former slaves actually considered enlistment as another form of slavery or servitude, as the life of an enlisted man was not his own. An assistant provost, provost marshal at Kansas City remarked that when talking to some black men in that city about enlistment, many men informed him that, quote, we have served long enough and it will be time enough when we are pressed or forced to go into the service. He explained this, quote, these men have obtained the idea that their, the service is dangerous and that their freedom is already accomplished. And in this portion of the state, with hardly an exception, they refuse to enlist. So in this vein, African-American men did not see the Civil War as this collective struggle to destroy slavery. These men viewed their freedom as individualistic and saw enlistment as secondary to their needs to secure financial or economic security. Now, outside of joining the army, the primary way that black men during the Civil War secured a measure of economic stability was through wage labor. The availability of contracted wage labor became where the opportunities became more plentiful in early 1863. As the military started to match thousands of former slaves with the, in the region with loyal employers, many whose enslaved workforces had left for freedom. Plantation, plantation owners especially wanted or needed to keep their operations running, and by not having workers to cultivate the fields, they risked losing all that they had. Contracts were usually done or written uh, by uh, military officials uh, at St. Louis. And this is only one of three examples of actual free labor wage contracts that I have been able to find in the, the last six, seven years of research that I've conducted. Uh, this was out of Benton Barracks, uh, St. Louis, and this was a contract for $12. Uh, this man was uh, employed by a union surgeon by the name of James Martin, who eventually would be sued uh, because he did not follow the terms of his contract, uh, interestingly enough. But juxtaposed against enlistment, contracted employment provided a measure of physical and financial security that military life could not provide. While black men who found employment through the free labor system uh, conducted only expected to earn exactly what, roughly around or a little bit more than soldiers made, other African American men operating outside of the purview of military officials could earn much more money. In some instances, I saw some people earning as much as $3 a day. 
Uh, that was not typical. That was at a time where there were vast labor shortages in western Missouri. But some men obtained jobs as riverboat porters uh, or um, waiters. And they did a lot better than men in the Army. Free labor opportunities become so abundant that they were actually the greatest deterrent to the formation of additional regiments in Missouri. One officer complained, quote, wages is high and demand for hands keeps the Negroes out of the army. Is there any way by which these men can be recruited, end quote. By May of 1864, it was evident that most black men in Missouri viewed free labor as a better option than military service. Low, en low enlistment numbers pushed the Union Army to consider drafting men to the military, which they did beginning in September of 1864. But representative of, e of a desire either to find or seek out the highest paying job or a concern that military life or enlistment could be directly or indirectly detrimental to their families, a significant number of formerly enslaved men rejected or delayed military service in favor of wage labor opportunities. Now the allure of non-military work options among formerly enslaved men is only part of the story when we examine the tension between enlistment and free labor. One segment of the black population that I have not mentioned tonight that are important to the story are free black men. Now their response to the call for enlistment was even starker than their enslaved counterparts. While only some enslaved men or formerly enslaved men rejected military service, in contrast, the vast majority of free black men rejected federal military service altogether. Like enslaved men, free blacks uh, viewed military service through the lenses of opportunity, individual need, and necessity. And many chose to work instead of fight. And although their race limited their employment prospects, free black men, especially at places like St. Louis, were often able to secure a steady income in a variety of fields outside of the army. Free black men not only found jobs as laborers or farmhands, but also found employment in more specialized occupations like carpentry or blacksmithing. Even men who served as porters or waiters earned enough money to take care of their families uh, in 1861 and 18, uh, through 1865. Some African Americans, in fact, made considerable sums working as riverboat porters or barbers, which was a, a very lucrative profession for African American men in the 19th century. I've even found one example of a wealthy African-American barber by the name of Henry Clay Morgan paying $300 to another African-American to serve in his place in the military. At, there was a period in which if you were drafted or if you didn't want to serve, you could pay someone else $300 to serve in your place and be exempted from military service. Henry Clay Morgan is the only African-American uh, man I've been able to find that did this. But that was representative of his wealth and his relative influence in St. Louis at the time. So free black men in, in St. Louis and other places could earn far more than the 10 to $13 that African American soldiers made at the time. And as a result, by and large, they are going to reject military service. Because the Federal Army paid less than what a number of skilled uh, black artisans made, free black men may have seen military service as a burden, a financial burden. And we can glean this idea from a letter that I found from a black barber 
to head of military operations in Missouri. And in this letter, he expresses his concern about pay given to privates. In this letter, and it's kind of hard to read, he says this, I think that I am sufficiently patriotic to go into the ranks, but a young family who are dependent upon me could not uh, live upon the pay that are paid to privates. If nothing else could be had, I should like to get, be given a recruiting commission. So he says that, yes, I'm patriotic, I want to help the union cause, but if the pay is not right, I'm going to go back to cutting hair. Nonetheless, in addition to, to financial concerns, other factors push free black men to reject military service. The primary reason that any man or enslaved men went into the service was to secure their freedom. Free black men, on the other hand, had no such need. A seriously understudied aspect of the black community's response to the Civil War surrounds the issue of class. Notions of class divided the African-American community and in many ways shaped how some African-American men responded to the Union's call for black soldiers. By virtue of their pre-war position, free black Missourians held a measure of social status that distinguished them from the enslaved population. While some were born free, others had worked hard to save enough money to purchase their own freedom and the freedom of other family members or friends. Others, however, sued for their freedom on, based on technicalities of the Missouri law. Although they didn't have the same rights as white men, they did have freedom of movement, they had the right to enter contracts, and they had the right to own property. But former Missouri slave, Henry Bruce, you know, really highlighted this class divide in the African American community. Henry Bruce is a former Missouri slave. His brother would become the first uh, African American senator uh, elected to the Senate. He said this, the free fellows, felt themselves better than the slave because of the fact, I suppose, that they were called free. While in reality, they were no more free than the slave until the war set both classes free. But illuminating the cultural and social divides between those freed before the war and those emancipated during the conflict, Reverend Edward L. Woodson, an African-American Baptist minister living in St. Louis at the time of the war, alluded to this class dynamic in regards to enlist his enlistment and his testimony to the American Freedmen's Commission. And he said this. This is, was, a, was a remarkable quote that I couldn't believe I found. He said this. He said, quote, the colored people generally are not so much in favor of it, but there are a good many who are in favor of it. He clarified, the free people who have bought themselves are not much inclined to it, but the others. And he says that kind of derogatorily. But the others are in favor of it. They rarely decline unless there is some influence brought to bear upon them. End quote. Other states, interestingly enough, saw similar patterns. Commenting on the free people of color in Virginia and Maryland, historian and veteran of the Civil War, Joseph Wilson, noted, quote, that this class of people never enlisted in great numbers, either before or after 1863, and there finally became to be a general want of spirit within them, while among the slave class, there was a ready enthusiasm to enlist, end quote. But although free men of color, for the most part, did not enlist in federal regiments, others did serve in several militia units designed to defend and protect their home counties and other strategic areas. The initial response to form black militia units in places like St. Louis was tepid. The first black militia unit in the state was known as the 2nd Battalion St. Louis City Guard Colored Infantry. And they were formed uh, in preparation of what they thought was Price's invasion of Missouri in October of 1864. But this call for a battalion 
and the largest city in Missouri at the time with the largest free black population only yielded 87 recruits. 87 recruits. This was far less than they wanted and was very reflective of not only class concerns but also, and I found this out later, it's the fact that these men were not paid for their service. Nonetheless, if malicious service would have remained optional for black men, I am pretty sure that free black men probably would have stayed on the sidelines as long as they could. But circumstances in Missouri changed, and free black men will serve, albeit briefly. There are a number of black militia units uh, formed during the Civil War in the state of Missouri, but the vast majority, the bulk of them, are organized not as voluntary regiments, but were created following the passage of a state law in February of 1865, when the Missouri General Assembly reactivated the Missouri Militia Organization and ordered that all inhabitants, as it says, of the state of Missouri who had not been exempt previously due to age, occupation, and health, would be included in the mandatory enrollment in their respective counties. This new call for enrollment reflected the recent abolition of slavery the month previously. African Americans who had been previously exempted from militia service were now subject to the provisions of this act. And as a result, African Americans formed several black companies attached to uh, white militia regiments led by white officers. The largest regiment would be a standalone regiment in St. Louis, the 52nd uh, Colored Militia. And more than 3,000 men, who many of them skilled laborers, business owners, we've got tobaccoists, uh, we do have farmers, uh, rivermen, porters, blacksmiths, and others. But we have more than 3,000 African-American men in the largest city in the state who up until February of 1865 had rejected military service completely. These men, who will consider themselves veterans, will never see combat. And many of the notable veterans of the Civil War, like James Milton Turner, like Charlton Tandy, would be regimental officers for this regiment. What I find very ironic, though, is that as black men petitioned for the right to vote uh, in 1865, free black men, collectively, would refer to themselves as the only true representatives of black veterans, something that it still blows my mind when I read that. But choosing to enlist in the military and choosing to engage in free labor represented two different approaches that black men in Missouri took to secure their families during the Civil War. The disorderly collapse of slavery in Missouri pushed African American men to forgo emerging notions of black patriotism in favor of doing that which most benefited their families. Emancipation for all and equality under the law was important, but of secondary concerns to the pressing needs of food, shelter, clothing, and financial stability. These stark choices should not be proof of selfishness or an absence of a long-term vision for the race, but instead they should be viewed for what they were. Difficult choices made during a time of unprecedented socioeconomic upheaval and war. The inference that African Americans collectively thought, acted, or were driven by the same motivations belies the fact that they, like other ethnic and racial groups, did not operate as a monolith. Thus, the African American response to the Civil War was diverse. It is truly my hope that scholars of African American history and the Civil War will re-examine black participation in the war in other states to fully understand how black families viewed and interpreted the war. African Americans are not figures to lionize or objects of pity. 
They were simply people with hopes, dreams, and aspirations, and diverse views on life. And although the United States rejected enlisting African Americans at the beginning of the Civil War, conditions in the second year pushed the Union Army to muster in black soldiers. And the use of black soldiers by the Union Army provided the United States with an advantage over the Confederacy and ensured that the institution of slavery would be irreparably broken. Analyzing Civil War era primary sources through the lenses of not only race, but class, provides a rich new perspective concerning the, the makeup of black military companies and reveals that most African Americans viewed military service from an individual and not a collective perspective. African American military service in Missouri depended heavily upon the indiv individual needs, conditions, and desires of men who had the opportunity to enlist. Formerly enslaved men enlisted in federal regiments mainly to secure the basic needs of food, shelter, and clothing for themselves and their families. While black men, reflective of class and financial concerns, enlisted primarily in local militias or rejected military service altogether. But though individual concerns guided free and enslaved men as they responded to the Civil War, both groups worked together towards creating better opportunities for black Missourians in the post-war period. Thank you very much. I'd be happy to take any questions. I can't see out there in the audience too well. The light is pretty bright. But if anyone has a questions, please, please come down to the microphone. I'll be happy to answer them. Hi. Hi, how are you? Good. Um, as I'm sure you, you know, Lincoln University was founded by the 62nd, 62nd of course. Colored Infantry. And I was wondering if you could comment, I'm, I mean, what you're talking about in terms of practicality of those who didn't want to join the military. There also was some idealism among those who did join. And I, so I'm wondering if there was kind of a split there, right? Because they did end up, those two infantries did end up donating of course. Uh, almost all of their earnings, even as pathetic as they were to form oh, the most educational institution. Most definitely, there, there, were, there was a, a man from the 62nd, I'm sorry, from the 65th, who donated about $100, nearly, maybe nearly a, a year's salary uh, to help uh, found Lincoln University. And there is idealism. There is, um, there is a, a greater cause that some men fought for. Uh, the patterns of enlistment tell me that that's not the, the primary reason why men are going into battle or enlisting in the army. I think it, it helps to serve as a justification or, or kind of a, a larger, broader cause that they were committed to. But in terms of de deciding whether to enlist, I, I really think it was these basic needs. And you know, a lot of people talk uh, about uh, Frederick Douglass, Martin Delaney, and their call for black soldiers to, to come into the army and to help destroy slavery. On the ground here in Missouri, uh, I just do not see that being the, the, the driving force or the motivating factor. If a man has um, a wife dying of smallpox or children literally starving, um, if military service is going to help them, then he is going to go into the army to make sure that they are fed. But if there are free labor opportunities that pay more, that allow him to stay with his family, uh, the pattern shows that they are going to go with those free labor options. Uh, in the post-war period, you're going to have a number of formerly enslaved people and free people working together to establish Lincoln, to help, it, help its expansion. But those class concerns remained a, an issue in the post-war period. It, it's something that's understudied. I think there needs to be more research on it, but um, I really think, and I, I go back to my training as a psychology minor and the son of a psychologist, uh, I go back to this notion of Maslow's hierarchy of needs. 
And it's this notion, if you don't have, you know, the first thing that you're looking for are the basics, food, shelter, and clothing. Then you can worry about uh, how other people view you, you know, going up the, the, the pyramid. And I really think it's those basic needs that are going to drive men to do what they did and to respond in the manner that they did. Thank you. Thank you. Wonderful presentation, please. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And we encourage everybody to meet um, outside to kind of uh, meet our, 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 our speaker and also ask questions as, as you wish. Thank you so much for coming. Good night.